Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, feeling so much immense gratitude to both Rabbi Rapport and Sam for being able to uh, communicate so much warmth and, uh, and joy, uh, even while uh, in the online format. So feeling very grateful to be here, very grateful to be here in the new year with you all. Um, and uh, I'm excited to share a little bit of Torah as well. Bo el paro, go toward Pharaoh, God commands, for I have made his heart heavy. The first line of this week's Parsha reminds us how throughout the 10 plagues, Pharaoh refuses to let B'nai Israel go until, of course, the very last plague, Makat Bechorot, the death of the firstborn, which can beg the question, how were Moses and Aaron able to have hope as they kept continually asking to go free? I have spent this week thinking about hope myself trying to hold on to a small amount of it, even as all around me things are closing down, going remote, reminding me of March of 2020. The classic quote from Emily Dickinson goes, hope is the thing with feathers. In this metaphor, hope is light and airy. It allows us to fly or at least walk with a slightly sprightlier step. And there's a way in which this metaphor is apt. For example, the space between applying for a new job, potentially, across the country or somewhere new, and before actually moving is a time of excitement and imagination at what your new life could look like. However, excuse me, similarly, the idea that things will improve eventually can keep you going throughout tough times. However, I came across a different poetic met metaphor this week that felt more descriptive of my current relationship with hope. The poet Jane Hirschfield writes, I know that hope, is the hardest love we carry, which allowed me to think of hope as something heavier, like carrying a stone around all day in your pocket, solid and weighty, but always there. Because yes, hope can be galvanizing and euphoric and exciting, but it can also be agonizing and anxiety provoking and well, in some ways, hopeless. In a 2007 New York Times Magazine article titled, Hope Can Be Worse Than Hopelessness, the author explains that research has shown that in patients who have long-term care needs, their quality of life was better, paradoxically, when they did not think that their condition would improve. This is because continually hoping for reprieve can only carry us through for so long. Or as a friend and I recently coined a new phrase while talking the other day, having hope can feel terrible, but not having it feels worse. Attempting to walk through this pandemic with hope is perhaps a bit like having a hardened heart ourselves. We want our plague to be over so badly, and yet each time a new wave hits, our hearts turn a bit stonier toward the hope that there is an end in sight. There's a connection between this moment in the Torah, in Parshat Bo, where Moses and Aaron introduced the final three plagues and the binding of Isaac. A Hasidic commentary says that the 10 plagues are set up in parallel to the 10 trials of Abraham, with the final plague, the death of the firstborn, in parallel to Abraham's final trial, the near sacrifice of his own firstborn, Isaac. In the Abraham and Isaac story, Isaac is saved by Abraham's sudden seeing of a ram, which becomes the sacrifice instead. Imagining Abraham's own relationship with hope here is an interesting exercise. No doubt the entire climb up the mountain, Abraham's heart is sinking, and he is hoping that the whole excursion will be called off. However, the text itself is devastatingly silent with regard to Abraham in this moment. He appears to be struck speechless. There is a Midrashic tradition that Abraham does indeed argue with God here. He asks God, Ribono shel olam, master of the universe. A friend might test a friend's loyalty. But you, who know what is in my heart, who can see inside my soul, how can you test me like this? The Holy One responds, okay, you have spoken what was in your heart. Now I will say what I wish to say. God explains, in the future, Isaac's descendants will sin and I will judge them on Rosh Hashanah. If they want me to recall their goodness and their positive qualities, let them blow upon this shofar. Abraham asks, what shofar? And the Holy One says, turn around. 
It was then that Abraham lifts up his eyes and looks, and behold, there's a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And so in this way, the shofar becomes both what saves Isaac immediately and also what saves Israel for generations going forward. There are two blessings associated with this moment. The first is, Baruch Ata Adonai Yodea Trua. Blessed are you, God, who knows Trua, who knows our calling out. Abraham's, Abraham hears the Trua, the call of God, the call of the ram's horn, and his heart is burst open. In Egypt, Israel is looking for a similar Trua moment, an event to shatter Pharaoh's hardened heart. The second blessing for this moment is Baruch Ata Adonai Goel Yisrael. Blessed are you God who redeems and saves Israel. Fascinatingly, this blessing is most often associated with the crossing of the Red Sea and the redemption of Israel from the Egyptians, which starts right at the tail end of this week's Parsha. But the sages remark that it can also be said over this earlier story, the saving of Isaac, because of course, as a result, all of Israel was saved. However, the commentary says, Avraham is just one single person saving one single person from being killed. And now in Shemot, there is an entire nation. In the Egypt story, we have grown and Israel is now many. So what type of Trua'ah is needed when so many people are involved? How do we arrange for a collective Trua'ah for, for the Egyptians and a collective hope for the Israelites? The Hebrew word for hope is tikva, a word that means both hope and a specific amount of time, hinting at the fact that in order for hope to be effective, it needs to be con contained to a particular amount of time. But if we look closer, the root of the word tikva is kuf vav he, kaveh, which means both to hope and also quite wonderfully to gather. So how do we do it? How do we have hope when there is no defined endpoint right now? Maybe the answer is that we don't, or at least that we don't have individual hope, but we can have hope in the gathering of all of us together. There is a line in Psalms 89 that says, Ashrei ha'am yodei trua'ah. Happy are the people, the community, the nation, the gathering that know trua'ah. The people who know the power of a heart shattering cry. Happy are the people who band together during these devastating moments. I may not be able to have hope by myself, but I can have faith in this holy community, in all of you, in coming together on Zoom or in person, in checking in on each other, in creating a space to simply be with each other. Or to quote the late great prophet of love, Bell Hooks, rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. Let's approach each other during this time with the knowledge that all of our hearts are a little heavier right now. And hopefully at the end of all of this, we'll be able to bless Baruch Ata Adonai Goel Yisrael together. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so, so much. And I look forward to spending more Shabbatot both in Zoom and hopefully in person with you all. Thank you.